Good morning. So while we're just waiting for a few more to join in, how about you all just uh, say hello to everybody and uh, we will be starting probably in about four to five minutes, okay? So uh, how is everybody doing? Good morning, Pete. <laughs> Tiffany says she's enjoying isolation as much as possible in Muskoka. Ah, oh, Tiffany's in Muskoka. Well, hello from Muskoka. <laughs> to Muskoka. <laughs> We're still trying to figure out a few things. Uh, obviously, we've moved. We're out of the sanctuary. We're actually in my office. Um, we're trying to figure out if our online portal, those of you who are trying to watch over there, is working. Uh, for some reason, I'm not picking up any video today. Um, and it says that we still have an hour and 20 minutes until the service starts. Um, but it is set up for 1030 Eastern Standard Time. Uh, so we're trying to figure that out. Um, if you're on with Facebook Live, we're going live right now and uh, we'll continue on through that um, and we'll work on the other side of it as we go forward. So I'll open in prayer and we'll jump right into the worship time and then Heidi and Michaela will come back and we'll move forward through our service. Join me as we pray. Father, we thank you that you allowed us still to come in, uh, even though it is still a, a trying time in our world, that you've given us this moment to connect with you and with others through our technology. And I pray, Lord, as we would meet with you today, as we would uh, serve you, that you would move in our homes where we are gathered today, that each and every one of us would experience a time with you like we never have before, that you would set peace upon us, that we would take a moment to be still. And so, Lord, we give you our praise today and ask that you would move in our midst and that you would be uh, over all of this, that your glory would fall. So come and be in this place, Lord, and in each of our homes, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning again. It is an honor to be able to um, lead and worship this morning. Um, so let's just, in our homes and in this office, May we just feel that freedom and the presence of God uh, as we just worship him this morning.
So Lord, we, in the midst of not knowing how life is going to turn out, which is often how we enter into every day, in this trying time, Lord, we would want to declare that it is well. With our soul, it is well. So Lord, as we move into a time of hearing your word, I pray that you would be in this place. That you would be upon your scriptures, your word, that you would share your heart. God, that you would give us peace. It goes past any sense of knowledge that we have or understanding that we hope to attain, that we would be able to find the peace that you give and you alone. So in these moments, Lord, that we would know where to look. That yes, we pray for those who are looking for vaccines and those who are looking to end the spread. God, we pray that you would move beyond anything else, miraculously, that we would go back to what we thought was normal, that we would take this time, that we have come closer to you, and that we would center on that and move forward as we approach life in this new sense. God, move across this world. Let your glory be seen in every corner of this planet. So Lord, we give you these times. We give you this moment to share your word and pray that you would be blessed by it. And those who are listening are blessed and encouraged. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If uh, you are trying to access through the church online portal, um, there are some internal errors. Every time I try to update the stream, it keeps saying that there's an internal error. Um, there's nothing at this point. I don't know if it's working because every time I try to go through it, it just kept saying error, error, error. So I don't know where we're at. Uh, if it's working or not, I apologize if you were over there and trying to get it or if right now you're just looking at a blank uh, screen there at this point is nothing I can do to get it to work I'm just gonna readjust myself to try to get that screen visible everything's kind of in the wrong spot <laughs> see the screen? Um, it's just that you're not quite at the point where you've moved. <laughs> okay. Um, still leaving? I think you're fine. <laughs> it's trying to update. Okay. Just trying to, I don't know if the Janish screen's has, visible. It's, it's working. It's kind of everywhere, but. Um, Janish. <laughs> Janish, yes. <laughs> So we, uh, we're in a time in Canada and really the entire world where we, we're facing the same issue. For one of the first times in many of our lifetimes, uh, we are all facing this same setting around the world of uh, circumstance. Our circumstances have actually brought about a sort of unity that no one really wants to be in. However, this season is also allowing us to do what humans have not done for many decades, and that is slow down. Ask yourself, in your life, when is the last time you were able to slow down? Think about it. We live in a culture that is fixated on the instant. We have a drive-through culture. I, I refer to it as a drive-through culture because what we want is to be able to say, here's my need, here's my desire, here's my want, and then we want it right away. We want it our way. We want it to be done in a timely fashion. It's also a culture where, if it's broke, we just buy a new one. We, uh, we don't have a dishwasher in our house right now, and I don't have a problem with that, washing through uh, the dishes by hand. But I remember having a dishwasher and being so thankful that it worked because I had friends in a seven year span who went through three dishwashers because it was broke and it was cheaper to buy a new one and install it than it was to fix the one that they had. But we live in that kind of a culture. Something that we have is broken. We just go buy a new one, or we do what we can to get a new one. We don't work and have the patience and slow down to make what we have possible. 
We don't have patience for much of anything or anyone. It's actually very limited in the way that we have patience. If you think about this drive through culture, the last time you went to a drive through what was it like? Did you have to wait for the people a couple cars ahead as they ordered a large amount uh, of food, coffees? If you're going to Tim Hortons right now and you know their dining experience is closed, uh, you have people going through ordering six or seven different meals, and those are all made fresh. Most of the ingredients are ready already, we know that, but they're compiled together into that sandwich on the spot, and then the coffees and everything else coming together. It's not a two minute wait. Sometimes you're waiting 20 minutes as everybody lines up to order their meal. We live in this culture where everything we want has to be done instantly, and right now with our circumstance, we have no choice but to slow down to be still, to allow God to move. Now I know the pain of waiting in these moments, praying and hoping that this virus moves past us all together. Sometimes we get lost in our thoughts and we begin to dream up worst case scenarios. Not just based around the season we are in, but often we find ourselves developing irrational fears around any situation we can imagine. Or maybe you've done your best to be distracted this past week. Now I know knitting has been very popular in my house. My son picked it up last night and he's one of our sons, and he's been hammering away at something, a hat. Uh, maybe Netflix has been your thing. Maybe you've uh, begun binge watching old uh, sitcoms or whatever it is that you watch. Maybe it's been video games. It's possible that you've just thrown yourself into whatever work needs to be done around the house. I saw someone on Facebook commented this morning, so many people out cleaning their garages. Now hear me on this one, maybe you spend every waking hour consuming books and blogs and online sermons trying to figure out what this season means for us. Now any of these things in their own time is not necessarily bad. It's okay to spend time on Netflix with your family, to do some knitting, to play some video games, to pour into the work around the house or the work that you have through your job, and it's okay to pour into some blogs and some online sermons to build your spirit. But any of them, when they are our focus, including reading the Bible, including listening to sermons, when you do not have a focus on the heart of Jesus in that moment, you've placed yourself in a state of just being busy to keep, what might, to keep you from what might be haunting you. If you, want, if you know me, what, one thing that you may know about me is that my mind tends to find hundreds of conclusions to every situation. Now that might be an exaggeration, but I can tell you numerous times where I've had dozens and dozens of conclusions come to mind based on what a scenario is. There was one time uh, where a board member of ours was going off to work at a camp. Now, my mind knowing he's going for a year, he signed a contract, he's going to do two jobs that two men did, and he's doing it himself, my mind went to many conclusions. One of them being uh, that he would be offered the job to lead the entire camp. Another area was that he would get lost on the mountainside trying to go up and free the hydroelectric dam. Another had him quitting after a couple of days because he couldn't do the work. Another had him actually dying on the job. I also had a conclusion that his work would see many people come to faith. One that, another conclusion that people in our church would rise up and they'd start to serve in areas that they hadn't before. And another capacity or another uh, conclusion that God would sweep across our area because this man decided to go and serve in a place he was uncomfortable. There were others as well, but the point is my mind went to many different areas, and that is often the case in my life. In the end, he served for a year, he had a good time, it was hard work, and then he moved back home. That was the conclusion, which was one that I came to, along with dozens of others. Now we can be very tempted to do this right now, because of the situation we all find ourselves in, but I believe the voice of God is calling to our lives right now. Be still. In a moment, we're going to go, go into Psalm 46 and read it in its entirety. If, you are on, if the church online portal is working, you can actually click on the Bible app or the Bible tab and read from your favorite translation. I'll be reading from the NIV Psalm 46. Something to know about this psalm is that it is a response to the, to the psalmist's lamentations in Psalm 42 to 44, and it is a redirect from Psalm 45. The former of which, 42 to 44, there are questions from the outside and from the internal, where is your God now? 
Is he sleeping? Has he forgotten about you? And later in Psalm 45, sings praise to the king on his wedding day, and the psalmist now in 46 is redirecting us back to God. He is the one who deserves our praise and glory. So now readers are directed back to the Lord in this and reminded of his show of mercy. So let's read all of Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought upon the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shield with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Now the entirety of this psalm is written with Israel in mind. It is not necessarily intended to be prophetic, though at times the nature of it feels that it is. It's an answer to the, to the cries of Israel. Where is God in my anguish? Why is he not responding? It is a psalm designed to answer the wants of man with the heart of God at a time where many things were uncertain and people were unsure where to turn. Now, it's interesting that sounds like our life right now. Our whole current situation around this world is, where do I turn? Where is God in my anguish? Things are uncertain. We don't know what to do. I mention here that though this psalm is intended to be a promise to Israel, the truth of the words we read, the truth of the words we read, give us more peace because we know how God has responded to the children of Israel throughout the centuries with mercy and grace, forever calling out to them with his love, pouring his devotion and favor upon them. When we know this, we will come to understand that passages like this one in Jeremiah 29, 11, though not written to me or you personally or anyone in this day, they can provide an even greater sense of courage because history has shown that God has never abandoned his people. He is always nearby. We see this repeatedly in scripture, including this psalm. The beginning of the psalm gives us a direct theme for the rest, and it is an application for the verses to follow. God is our refuge and strength. He is a help which is very accessible and easy to find. In fact, we are told by Jesus that this help comes by asking. You have not because you ask not. It also says that if you seek, then you will find. You knock and the door will be opened to you. When we ask, when we seek, God is readily found. The writer uses incredible imagery of natural disasters and declares that no matter how much the face of this earth changes, God is always present. Through earthquakes and avalanches, raging storms and seas, his hand is still stretched out for you and I to grab onto. We can undoubtedly add, this, decline, add to this declining economies, wars, and viruses. No matter how our world loses shape, God will always be present. Now the next portion, verses 4 to 6, give us a sense of the intimacy that God desires with his people. The accessibility we have to him both now and in eternity. That he dwells always among us. Then we come to verse 7 with another reminder that God is our fortress. Specifically, this speaks of a high place, such as a, a tower or a fortress on a hill beyond the reach of any enemy. It's here where we find rescue. You can actually find, uh, I did a Google search, and you can find many images and history lessons about the areas where people built fortresses on hillsides, high above where any enemy's bow could reach, where soldiers would have to climb and spend all their energy before they could reach those who they were pursuing. This is the image that we're given in this. God is the tower to where no enemy can reach us. And now in the final portion of this psalm, we are told to look on the works of God across the earth. 
how he has rescued his people. It uses the term desolation, but it actually means look on his redeeming works, which often in the times of Israel came by destruction upon the earth. How it, it speaks of how he rescued his people and how he spared them. He has rendered enemies unarmed, and with his voice he has silenced wars. Again, we are reminded at the end of the psalm that God is our fortress. But I want to turn you specifically to verse 10 this morning, where we will spend the remainder of our time. It says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. There are three words I want you to take from this psalm which speak of God in our lives as a refuge, and they will help us to understand how in these times we can, inst we can be still and know. Here they are, permanent, accessible, comforting. Now, permanent speaks of the fact that he's always with us. Accessible is that he's always fully available, not just portions of him. He doesn't give a piece of himself. He gives himself in full measure, finally comforting in that he is in control. Now there are seasons in life where each one of these are difficult to see. But maybe the hardest one to see in these hard moments of life is that he is in control. Now here's what I mean. If you spend some time in worship or reading the Bible or praying, listening to someone share what God has done in their life, listening to a sermon, uh, you can get a fair picture that God is accessible and see how he's always active in your world. Or maybe you enjoy nature, and in that setting, you can recognize God's hand in your life. Maybe it's spending time in the garage working on a car or building something with your hands, and you, you can see how God speaks to you in that moment that you create. But can you imagine God in control at all times? And is every waking moment filled with that comfort? Let's talk about be still and know, and hopefully it gives you some context to find comfort even in this season. First, why do we find it hard to see God as in control? We want to see God as in control through removing of all things which threaten us by answering our every prayer the way we want him to, by never waiting in our time of need, but to respond instantly. Do it as I want and do it now. It speaks of the way we live our life. Go up to the drive through order, get to the window, pay, get your food, leave. You want it in the moment the way you, the way you ask. When we say God is in control, that he is, that he is our refuge and strength, our fortress, our rescue, we expect it to be all through, we expect it to be, um, <laughs> sorry, we expect it to be the way we want it, not who he is now, but who we want him to be. That would be comforting, wouldn't it? To know that the God who created you is at your complete beck and call, that everything you ask is answered in that moment. But then, if this were true, he wouldn't be God. He would be some sort of a genie. He would be our image of who God wants, or who God should be. In order to recognize that God is comforting, that he is in control, we need to understand what the words be still and know mean. Some of you watching, you may be fans of boxing or UFC or some form of fighting, some sort, some form of fighting sport. The one thing that is true of these sports and really most every other contest is the ready form, which very simply is a posture to be ready to defend and attack. Usually it means that your hands are up. You're, you're ready to defend what's coming and you're ready to strike back when needed. In the time that this psalm was written, if you were a soldier, it meant that you carried a shield in one hand and a weapon in the other, and it engaged both your hands at all times. Even while you were walking, you were always ready. Maybe your sword was in the sheath, but you had your shield ready. If not strapped to you in some way, it was always prepared to defend. Your hands were always trained to be at the ready. When God says, be still, what he is saying to all of us is incredibly profound. Be still doesn't mean to freeze in place. It's not like you're running around with your kids or your friends when you were younger playing freeze tag. It's not, I caught you, stop, don't move, and you're in that sudden kind of pose of how long do I stay? It actually means relax. Now you can imagine yourself in a lazy boy chair, maybe right now with coffee and in pajamas, uh, but it just means relax. Specifically, 
your hands. If this is ready position, shield on one, sword in the other. What God is saying to people at that time is, relax your hands. Let them sink to the side and stop striving. He's telling those listening to stop putting out all the effort as though what you are about to do can make the biggest difference. Now, sometimes we are called to move and put out effort, but there are times that we are told to be still. I believe we are in a time like this right now, where God is asking us to listen to what the government has said, and while doing this, to be still, to listen for his voice, to watch as he moves. The second part of be still speaks of leaving matters to God. It literally means let your hands go and let God do as only he can do. And one author says to be still is to be without anxiety about the issue. It's a standing in place beside God, hands rested, allowing him to do what only he can do, and that is to be our rescue, our provider, our healer. We cannot provide our self-rescue. In this season, we can pray for the scientists who are looking for vaccines. We can pray for those who are isolating that they would recover. We can pray for whatever it is that is at our, on our heart that God would move, but we must allow God to be God and relax our hands. Watch him move. There's a very powerful image in Exodus 14 which shows God at work when we are still. Moses has discovered his true identity and he's now been the voice to Pharaoh, uh, for God to Pharaoh to let the children of Israel leave his rule. Now if you're familiar with the story, you know that there's a lot of uh, plagues that come across Egypt in that time. And after much dispute on Pharaoh's, uh, on, from Pharaoh, his pride is finally broken. And Moses is allowed to lead Israel out of Egypt. But for a short time, they walk into the wilderness without problem, and then Pharaoh begins to pursue them. Eventually, we come to the point where Israel stands between the pursuing Egyptians and the sea. Now, if you've seen the cartoon adaptation, Prince of Egypt, you're familiar with this is the moment where Moses raises his hands and the sea parts and the Israelites walk across the dry ground and they're looking at the sides of the water as if they're in some kind of aquarium. I think of marine land instantly as, as you walk through or SeaWorld or wherever it is, the Vancouver Aquarium, is you can look at the fish behind the glass and in the Prince of Egypt you see whales and fish swimming against the sides of the water as the Israelites walk on dry ground. But it's what Moses says before this happens that shows the power of being still. Now remember that Egypt is hoping to either capture Israel or kill them. And at this point, uh, Moses does not order them to pick up whatever weapon they can find. Now I don't know how you would react, and I don't really know how I would react in that moment. I'd probably either run away, try to swim across the sea, or beg for mercy. A slim chance I'm going to break a table leg off and run after people with sword and spear. I'm not going to re react in that manner, but I'm going to find a way to make sure that I live through the moment. But faced with this incredibly difficult moment, this is what Moses says. Do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. It's the exact opposite of fight for your life. He says, be still. You can imagine having thousands of people around you with sword and spear on chariots chasing you down to recapture you and bring you back to slavery. Or you have a sea on the other side. And Moses doesn't say, raise your hands. He doesn't say, take up arms. He doesn't say, run for your life. He says, Stand still, relax your hands, watch as God moves, marvel at his saving power, be in awe of the way that he loves you. Comfort, God is in control. He is with you, he is for you, always accessible, always in control. Though it's still hard in these moments to see what God is doing, that is where the second part of this verse comes in. Be still know that I am God. It speaks of the type of knowledge that you get from experience. Now, if you play an instrument, you pick it up and start to play, and you know instantly when it's out of tune. If you're a mechanic, 
You know what's wrong with the car often just by listening to it. The psalmist challenges us here. If you are a believer, you know who God is and you know what he can do. We have experienced this move before and we rest in the knowledge that he is still the same today as he was then. My mind is actually thinking of this moment of being a parent and understanding the difference in a child's cry between I need something, I want something, and I'm in trouble. If you're a parent and you're thinking about it, you know the difference of when there's a cry of pain or some kind of trouble, when there's a, a, a whiny sound of I just want this and I can't get it, or when there's a legitimate need. And the sound of the voice that carries in that moment, this is that experiential knowledge. To know who God is, is to know who he is through experience. As I said last week, I cannot say what this virus will do. I cannot say who will get it and who will not. I don't know how long it will last. I know that there have been many people uh, from every walk of life, including very strong Christians who have been affected by this, many people who are housebound, many who are in a hospital, and even more still who have died. I don't know what the end result of this is, but what I can do is I can listen to the instruction of health specialists, I can pray for a quick end, either by vaccine or the miraculous move of God, and all the while, I can remain still and know that he is God. What that means to me is that while I am here, I can know that God will move and he will use these situations to bring people to him so that they can experience peace. And at the same time, I know that on the back side of life, that when we are no longer breathing on this earth, that my God has promised an eternity to me. See, all my striving cannot help in this or any other season, really. Any worry will not increase my days or help me find a way out. Only in knowing who God is and how he acts will I stop worrying when I'm faced with a problem, persecution, or circumstance. Now, if you're watching, you know who Jesus is, but you find it hard to be still. Focus first on who God is and how he responded in your life and the lives of others. Hear the testimony of your friends of what God has done. Listen uh, to yourself speak about how God has moved in your life and know that he is God in that. And in those moments, I believe, we'll start to be able to be still. If you don't know Jesus today, chances are, there is a greater sense of anxiety in your life today. What will happen to me? Will I live through this? What if I don't? Is there a place for me with Jesus? Now, I can't answer the first two for you, but I can't answer the, first, the last question. There is a place for all of us with Jesus. He came to this earth to make a way for every last person to have an eternity spent in his glory and splendor. The good news is that by coming to know Jesus today, what you will receive in that moment is peace that you've never known, a joy like no other, an eternity that is set in stone. By coming to know Jesus in this moment, what you will experience is an opportunity to be still and know that he is God. Now, how do you do this? Well, the Bible says that we need only repent and believe. That is to change your mind about Jesus, to say, you know what? The Bible is real. What it says is true. And I need to believe in him, to accept and to follow him, and to say you are who you are. Then you begin to be still. You know that he is God. Now if that's you today, and you want to respond virtually, you can send an email to the church or to the Facebook group. If our online portal is working, there's actually a button where you can respond to that moment. It's an opportunity for us to interact and give instruction on the other side of it. But my prayer for you today, and we're going to pray in a moment and go back into another song of worship. My prayer for you today is that you will come to understand how to be still. That through your experiential knowledge of who Jesus is, you will be able to look to him and to say, God, I know that you are real. And I'm going to trust you in this season. And I'm going to let you move. And I'm going to let you be God. That you will know and be still. Let's pray. Father, I thank you.
for these moments where we are able to come together through virtual moments, through virtual through technology, and that we can focus on your heart. God, I, I pray that we would stop all of our striving, that we would spend time in prayer for those who are fighting this virus, and that we would see normal come back, but that we would not lose our focus on you, that we would know how to be still, and that we would know that you are God. I pray for all those who do know you, Lord, that you would use these moments and bring them deeper in love with you. And those who do not, who maybe in this moment are deciding, I, I want faith, I want to move forward in this, I want to know that he is God. That you would take this moment, Jesus, and that you would interact with them, that you would speak your love and your peace upon their heart. And that they would say the simple words, God, I, I changed my mind. I know that you are God. And I trust you. And from this moment, I follow you. Father, I pray for the days to come as we gather in prayer virtually, as, as we spend time on Facebook and in other mediums with friends, as we call people and connect with them, as we have our moments to rise up and say, how are you? Is there anything you need? Lord, that we would spend time with you as well. That we wouldn't focus on busy to keep our minds from going towards this virus, but Lord, that we would put our minds steadfastly on you. Lord, help us to be still in these moments. Give us courage in place of fear. Give us faith where we didn't have. Give us comfort, Lord, to know that you are in control. And even if this life is taken from us, you have promised us an eternity filled with your glory. Surround us in this moment, Lord, that we can get a glimpse of what that will look like so that our hearts would be centered on you. Father, we worship you in this place, in this day, in this time, wherever we are. I pray, Lord, that you would encourage each one to take some time and be still. In Jesus' name, amen.
we just wanted to make uh, available to any who are interested for this Wednesday, if I haven't said it already, at 7 o'clock on our Facebook page, we're going to have a time of prayer. Uh, try to do the hour and just join together to pray over, uh, obviously, our current situation, but anything else that's on our hearts as well. Uh, so if you're able to join us on Facebook, 7 o'clock this Wednesday, we're going to try something new and go through that experience uh, this week maybe go forward from there we did not for some reason we couldn't get the online portal to work today we'll work through the technical difficulties for next week and try to get that available uh, it looks like an internal error on their side but we'll try to work through that as we go we're going to conclude uh, with one more song this morning the words won't be on screen if you have been able to see them um, but please uh, join us if you know the song
thank you, Father, for this beautiful day that you have given us. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you, Father, that you are for us and you are with us. And we just worship you this morning. We just thank you for our church family and, uh, and the extended church family as we are all one body. And so just be with us this week, Father, and uh, teach us as we are still and we know that you are God. In Jesus' name, amen. Have an awesome su Sunday, Sunday afternoon <laughs> and a great week. We love you guys so, so much.